Hey everyone, welcome back to Better Biomed, and today I got a request for another Biomed story, and they asked for something that was from back in my military days, and I can say one thing's for sure, when you're a Biomed in the military, you never know what you're going to end up doing. You think you're going to be working on medical equipment and you're triaging patients. Or you could end up working on generators. Or you could end up, you know, helping fix the air conditioning systems for the building. You never know. But one thing's for sure. Um, I got to be careful on how I tell this story because I want to remain as respectful as possible to my brothers and sisters that were injured and uh, there's there's a lot of people that were injured both physically and mentally at the Battle of Iraq and the Battle of Afghanistan so um, on my end of it I went to uh, biomed school in 2003 and in the very beginning of 2004 I end up my first duty station which was Landstuhl, Germany. Well, I immediately got assigned to operating rooms and they handed me a stack of paperwork orders and they said get to it and that was basically my initial training. We were attached to an army unit and that's how they did business. Well, uh, I loved my time there. I absolutely loved it. And then we rolled around to about November of 2004 and that's when it all just fell apart uh, in some ways in other ways I, I watched something just fantastic happen so November 2004 is the Battle of Fallujah and the Battle of Fallujah if you guys don't know is when we basically rolled up to a major city over in Iraq and we said everybody that remains here in 24 or 48 hours you're gonna be treated as uh, a bad guy so you're gonna be treated as a combatant so we had to go door to door kicking in doors and searching houses all the while taking fire uh, when I say we obviously it wasn't me I was at the medical facility um, and none of us knew that this was happening I it's kinda of hard to believe but Believe it or not, we were just sitting there one day and we got an emergency call and they said there's buses heading up the hill full of wounded people and none of us really knew what the hell was happening. And so anyway, what you do is everybody responds and we put on our rubber gloves and uh, we go out to this large area and we stand there and we wait and we unload buses school buses that have been converted over to ambulances and uh, we unload them uh, full of patients so anyway uh, at first you know we thought it was you know just regular wartime casualties it's not that much until you get like three or four or five school buses loaded full of wounded now Launchstool Medical Center is a huge facility Normally they can handle wounded, but in this mass quantity, we were completely caught off guard and unprepared. So what they did is they attacked a major city with door-to-door -door combat, and they knew they were going to take casualties, and they did not let the medical facility downrange know. Now it's not just that I was a lower enlisted and I, I you know, I didn't know and they did. No. I heard two surgeons, two of the major surgeons in the operating room, since I was doing operating room at the time, and the two surgeons were at a scrub sink, and they were furious, absolutely furious, that they could go ahead and plan a mission downrange that was expected casualties and not let their major med center downrange know that they're going to be expecting mass transit. So we ended up, it was... Uh, it was a very interesting situation. We, as a team, you know, that's, that's another thing. You know, they always talk about Army, Air Force, Navy. We all make fun of each other. But when shit hits the fan, 
you want to see the most perfect team form and often you know the military hierarchy doesn't necessarily always work but when shit hits the fan that's when you find out who's the real leaders and who's the real followers and teams just develop like that and what we had to do is we went into some old warehouses that I don't know it was probably from the Korean or Vietnam War they had old cots just thrown in the corner and a whole bunch of stuff that anybody hadn't seen in a while so what we did is we pulled all this stuff out of storage in these old ass warehouses you know we worked throughout the night too it was, it was miserable work but I mean obviously that was our mission so we had to break down existing wards so you had all sorts of wards in uh, launch to a medical facility you had you know mother baby ward you had uh, audiology you had uh, optometry you had uh, all sorts of different wards and we had to break them down move all their equipment to the side and set up cots for all these wounded guys that we were just hauling in the operating room was ill supplied they were not ready None of us are ready for this, but I'll tell you what, I've seen the most perfect teams form in an instant when shit hit the fan, and we all just clicked, we knew what to do. It doesn't matter if you're Army, if you're Air Force, if you're Navy, if you're Marines, everybody was just chipping in, and we all just took orders from the guy that was giving orders, and we did what we had to do to create these wards for all the, the fresh influx of patients, and uh, it was an amazing time to see that happen because there's very few times where you see a team form so quickly and so perfectly um, and that was it it was it was an amazing experience and I will never forget some of the stuff that we've seen and some of my brothers and sisters out there that were there with us um, you know some of them are still working through it and God bless them you know we'll try and do what we can do but as biomeds you know, as I said in my previous videos, we are the problem solvers for the medical facility. So while you might be sitting there uh, fixing medical equipment on a normal day, a day like this, you're going to be assembling wards and you're going to be rearranging equipment for however they need it for that moment. And then 20 minutes later, they might have to have it all rearranged for another type of triage. You never know what you're going to run into. And it was absolutely amazing. Um, I don't really know what I can honestly say without uh, offending people because we've seen so much stuff so quickly. Um, one of the things that I'll, I'll remember to this day is uh, we had this one bus show up and it was special. It was very special. And I was right near the door when they opened it up. And, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of people that were burnt and blown up and stuff. We've seen a lot of that. Uh, we were we were right there with the nurses and the med techs and everything, um, helping patients, you know, get them to where they needed to go. But this bus was special. These guys were not sedated. And I will remember for the rest of my life the sounds these guys made as we unloaded them from this bus under escort. And we had to take them to a designated area of the hospital where nobody else was allowed to go. And in fact, as soon as we placed them down and the physicians came in, we were escorted out. And uh, I know they didn't have any patches on, no name badge, no unit badges, nothing. Um, and these guys, they weren't given anesthesia. Like normal guys would come in and they would be comatose or, you know, stabilized and uh, maybe on a propofol drip or something. But these guys... They were still screaming and uh, just miserable. The smell, the, you know, I I pray that these guys made it through. And, uh, you know, the, to this day, you know, a decade later, that these guys are doing all right. But uh, just holy cow, what, what an amazing, amazing situation. But anyway, these guys showed up. They didn't have any unit badges on and they had... Uh, they had a command sergeant major, and I, the only reason I know sergeant major is because somebody said sergeant major. Um, this guy had no badges on or anything, and there was also a chief. 
somebody called him chief. So I assume he was a seal or something like that. Uh, but he didn't have any badges on, but his uniform was a little bit different. Uh, both these guys, uh, had some facial hair, which is very unusual for some of these upper echelon people. Um, so some, one, one guy was called, uh, Sergeant Major and the other guy was called Chief. And they were escorting these guys to their designated area and we were commanded to get, uh, and it was somebody later that told me that they were special forces guys. And the reason that they weren't sedated is because they are worried that some of the stuff that they might say unconsciously. Uh, so these guys were very much so, uh, awake, maybe local anesthesia as much as possible, but, uh, they weren't given any drugs, you know, to help them upstairs. And, uh, I hope they're doing all right, man. Um, but that, that was one of my, uh, biomed experiences. It was the battle of Fallujah. And for over a month, we were 24 seven, you know, we could get called up at any time and we'd have to respond in within like an hour. And, we'd be unloading just buses full of people. And, you know, I think the major thing that affected me was I, at the moment I was 24 years old and a very large majority of the people that we unloaded were 18, 19 years old, maybe 20. So they're a fraction of my age. You know, they hadn't seen very much of the world and these guys' lives were going to be forever changed. So, uh, it's something I'll never forget and I'm very humbled by it every single day. And, uh, I also, I still pray that these guys are doing all right, man, because, uh, the guys that lived through that, uh, they, they definitely are going to have a, a rough journey ahead of them. But, uh, that's just a day in the life of military biomed. You never know what you're going to do. You're going to be treated just like a medic. Uh, when the situation arises so take those studies very seriously when when they give you self-aid buddy care and uh, try and take as many extra trainings as possible um, there's there's lots of guys that seen stuff way worse than me um, but since I was in the operating rooms I was always there you know when they you know I've seen where now they'll get mad guys uh, I'm dead serious I've I've been there, you know, when, when guys were in explosions, you know, they'd get glass and stuff behind their eyes. So they'd have to pull the eyes out. And uh, they had one operating room in the corner where they were always doing like glass removal and, uh, and reconstruction surgery around the, uh, the temple and the eye sockets and stuff. There was one room where I know that they did um, tissue shaving. Um, I, I, was, I would have maybe made it another story, but it was around the same time, so it's going to be part of this story. Uh, I was in an operating room uh, helping fix some operating room lights. We had some old Steris lights, and uh, there was this big dude. He was incredibly large, like very muscular, um, but it was only his upper torso. It, it was his torso in general. Um, from what I remember, he did have one arm, maybe two. But I, I will always remember that, like, he had no knees, no nothing below the knees. And they were sitting there and they were shaving the tissue. And mind you, we had such an influx of patients that we had to make do. Like, there were people holding the patients, you know, for positioning. Instead of using tape and all this fancy foam and stuff that they use nowadays, they were using text and stuff to hold the patients while they were, you know, doing what they had to do. And then they'd reposition them real quick because we had to... We had to get them out, get them stabilized, and then we'd ship them back to the United States. And uh, this one big dude, uh, I seen that. Now, what you guys might not realize is when you're unconscious, you're, you're dead weight. And your physics slightly change. And somebody that's really big like that, really muscular, when you get them up on the side like they had that guy, and they were, they were cutting tissue around the legs and they went to reposition him, and he started to fall off the table. So I ran forward into the operating room. I got up underneath him like this with my back. Now, mind you, this is, you know, sterile uh, environment and whatnot. But it's out of that or this guy goes over. And uh, I got up underneath this guy because he was a big dude. And uh, I pressed up with my back. And uh, I, I held him up there while they, you know, um, all rearranged what they had to do to hold him up there because... When they flipped him up on his arm on his side, uh, what they didn't realize is the physics were going to 
you know, your dead weight is going to carry you forward. And uh, that guy was going over. So um, there was a lot of that kind of stuff up there. Um, it was, what an amazing team. Some amazing people. And, uh, you know, we've seen a lot of crazy stuff. But uh, for the rest of my life, I'm going to be a very humbled person because of it. And I will always appreciate what I've got. So, anyway, that's one of the stories from uh, my biomed career. And that was my first year, year and a half as being a biomed um, in Longstuhl, Germany. So, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, I hope you like this video. Uh, it's very interesting. I know a lot of people don't talk about some of the stuff that goes on during the wars. But this is just one of those things I, I thought everybody should know is that there was a, a lot of men and women that just worked their asses off round the clock to, uh, you know, save some lives and uh, at least get these guys back to the United States, back to their families. So I hope you liked the video. Thanks for watching.